Hey, and welcome to Drafting Compliance. I'm Kane, he's Tom. And in our last episode, we talked about access controls. Today, we're gonna to be talking about something I've got some really big feelings on, which is about the incident response control family and associated policies. But before then, Tom, we're talking about, we're talking about beer today, right? We are always talking about beer. It is a staple of the show. And today we have something I think is gonna be pretty interesting to try. Um, I've had a lot of of brown ales. This is a, a Pulaski Pecan Brown Ale. So I'll see if I can show that label out there. I think um, they'll probably flash it on video here. I mean, I, I like pecan pie, right? That's yeah, you're, you're going to be disappointed delicacy. if you if you're thinking this is going to taste anything like pecan pie. But it is going to have. You're saying I'm going to be disappointed, Tom. <laughs> I'm I'm really surprised. <laughs> it is going to have a nice brown color. Uh, pe uh, nut brown ales in general, which pecan uh, nut, nut brown ale is a variant of are generally brewed with darker malts, so you get a nice brown color. They're usually not significantly hopped, so they're not going to be bitter hop. So you'll get some interesting flavors out of it. It'll be something less than our porter that we tried in terms okay. of, of of body and texture. But let's pour it and, and take a look. Go ahead and crack that beer. You know, the thing I'm learning to do in this show, other than FedRAMP compliance, is how to pour beer correctly. Oh, or how to spill beer on my floor correctly. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to eventually get this. In my next career as a bartender, I'm going to totally... So as, you, as you finish pouring that off, you'll notice it, it did pour with a nice head. So it's got a nice foamy head on top. This is awfully dark. I, I'm not getting brown. It's, pr it's pretty but, dark. Yep, and I'm like going to be coffee. honest with you. The smells of it are very woodsy, very nutty. So you might want to. Uh... So I have a light on my watch, actually, and, I, and you see here I've got a light, right? The light does yeah. not shine through at all. This is yeah. this is pitch black. This is not this brown. Is this is pretty. This is pretty dark for a, a nut brown ale. Certainly, you know, if you're used to like a Newcastle or something similar, uh, this is going to be a lot darker. What do you smell in there, Kane? That smells. Oh, geez, I got a foam on my nose. Yeah, it smells like beer so far. Um, mm. Maybe a undertone of molasses. Yeah, a little molasses. I, I smell that as well. I certainly smell a little vanilla in there. Maybe a little baking spice of some kind. Yeah, I could see the baking spice in there. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a mouthfeel and see what it's like. Now, Tom, you don't really do leg like on on whiskey, for example, or on scotch. You check the legs on this, but that's not a meaningful no. measure on beer, is it? It's not because okay. the the foam All is right. going to dominate that. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, um, here we are. Well, it's got that burnt coffee flavor to it. Oh goodness! I think you like it. It's got. Um, it's like sour coffee. Like if you were to take Sour Patch Kids, the, those horrible things, and put them in a cup of Charbucks, right, and take out all the other stuff that they put in their miserable coffee, right? And I should say this. I'm in the Seattle region, and yeah, no, I don't like Starbucks. Um, <clears throat> you'd get this. Well, I, I see it slightly different. I get a nice, <laughs> you do. I, I get a nice nutty, woody taste to it. It's, it's not as thick as a porter. Uh, so it's a little thinner on the tongue, and it um, it leaves behind a nice coffee, uh, chocolatey aftertaste to me. We need to do coffee reviews, Tom. I think you and I may not be on the same page for coffee. Yeah, I I like it. It's a it's again. I think I've said this before, but this is not a Sweet. a warm weather beer. This is a cold weather beer, at oh. least in my in the way I look at life. And I would drink this. Um, you know, maybe in front of the fireplace, maybe um, watching a football game on a cold Sunday afternoon. I think it's pretty good. You know, this is the second beer we've had that you've said you'd you'd drink in front of a fireplace. Yeah. I'm noticing a theme here. All right. Well, let's pivot from fireplaces to dumpster fires, right? And for those of you who are wondering, <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, he does have a plush dumpster fire in his background. Um, so incident response is what happens when you get a dumpster fire, right? And that's today's topic. And I want to start off at the top because FedRAMP requires a lot of documentation, Tom. And one of those key artifacts that gets examined is a policy document, right? That's correct. Almost every and that well, policy and that policy, it's not good enough just to write it, but you actually have to um, you have to disseminate it and you have to train it, right? That's correct. Every policy and every every controls family in FedRAMP requires policy. 
every policy has to have written right into it how it's disseminated. So who who gets it, who's required to get it. And then you have to train those people who are required to understand it, train it. So you train that policy. And then, of course, in the case of incident response, you have to actually execute a test against your incident response policy and, and plan. So in the, yeah, if in I remember the, FedRAMP's got like a requirement that there's a training environment too. So you're not actually doing like a live fire test against your production environment, but rather there's a simulation or a, a training environment, right? Yeah, you're allowed to do a simulated event with incident response. It can be a tabletop exercise. You're not required to actually, you know, physically infect anything or anything like that. So you can do a tabletop exercise. Um, of course, that's always with the caveat that your agency or the jab may require further testing down the road, but it's not written into the, into the um, FedRAMP regulations, at least it isn't as, as I've read them. And then, you know, before you ever get to the idea that you're going to have to do some testing, there is a lot of bits and pieces that need to be defined in incident response. And that's oh, really definitely uh, does, does FedRAMP align to the six steps that SANS lays out for incident response, like, you know, your detection and prevention at the beginning, all the way through to remediation and, you know, recovery. Correct. I would say those six phases, and I would be challenged to repeat them all rote right now, but those six phases are pretty common language in almost any framework for incident response anymore. So that's correct. I think one of them is containment, uh, for instance, one of one of the phases. But the and point now is- now we're doing is, trivia night with beer at the pub at this point yeah, in front of the fireplace, yeah. apparently. But it's got the standard six phases. So um, I, I think, Tom, you and I probably have had similar experiences in this. Uh, I always find that coordination of resources and who's on first becomes one of those most challenging bits that like, does FedRAMP require that that be documented or is that just my opinion that you should say like, who can declare an event? Who can declare a, I don't even want to say the B word. It, 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 it rhymes with beach. Um, do we want to go there? Correct. You want to define all that ahead of time. And this is a case where doing your work ahead of time is going to pay off in spades when you actually need it. Right. So you want to certainly you want to define your terms. So you said the word beach, but I'm going to use the word breach because it is a word. <laughs> uh, in in the in the world of information security, you should ramp up to the word breach. It shouldn't be something you use often. And you want to make sure that the parameters which define breach are thoroughly vetted. So including in my who world, can declare one because, you know, you that's not something you just toss around casually around a fireplace or a football game with a beer. That's something I think that has to be coordinated between chief counsel and the CISO and preferably the CEO, right? CEO, correct. That is correct. I mean, uh, the word breach carries a lot of connotation that are bad. Mm -hmm. And certainly when those words get used inadvertently in things like employee communications, those have a way of making it all the way up to the socials uh, at, at some at some point. So you want to be very, very careful when you use that. So in my world, I like to use the word event for anything that is security related that might be a, a law, an unusual log entry or um, a, a user raises an alarm, but you haven't verified it yet. And then the next step is incident in um, some some events may be incidents, but not all events are incidents. And again, mm -hmm. an incident is an escalated, but it doesn't necessarily mean you've lost any data. So you can have some incidents turn into breaches, but certainly not all incidents are breaches. So that, that's sort of the hierarchy. And again, our plan and our, and our policy is called a security incident policy and a security incident plan. There are definitions within that that allow it to move all the way to breach. But we, we take the we take the stance that every incident should be treated as a serious, uh, potentially uh, dangerous situation for the company's reputation and or customers' data. So one of the other things that I've found, Tom, and I'm just thinking, going back to your comment on tabletops, something I've often found, and I'd, I'd love to hear your take on for FedRAMP, is... FedRAMP doesn't just say you have to test it, but they also say you have to test the and determine the effectiveness of your incident response capabilities, not just your plan, not just your policy, but your actual incident response capabilities, uh, which is different than a lot of corporate standards or a lot of regulatory standards, which are like, yeah, you should probably test this on a maybe annual basis. Um, how are we going to actually go about testing and determining the effectiveness of our incident response capabilities? Yeah, great question. So 
There are a number of artifacts that get created with incident response. One of those is a post-mortem report. Mm -hmm. So every time an incident gets called, you're going to go through the incident response plan, which is the second artifact after the policy. And there are some procedures and things that slot into that as well. And then once you have resolved the incident, you're going to go through the post-mortem um, process, which is essentially measures how effective you were following the plan. Did you find gaps in the plan? Are there things that you would change? You know, are there additional tool sets that were required that you didn't have? You know, it's, it's really a, a front to back review of the entire process that you just went through. And it helps you understand how you can improve this. And in general, it measures your capability. So it's an after action review or a hot wash that happens both after an incident as well as goodness help us after a, a B word. Yep. Yep. Any of our any of our incidents may turn into a breach. That's why we start the, the process with an incident uh, Fair enough. response. Yep. So the other question that comes up to mind, just in terms of what's topical in the news these days, is around supply chains. And I know that NIST is releasing updated guidance fairly frequently on supply chains. Uh, I remember that FedRAMP's got some in there around supply chain coordination. Um, is Where does that remit lie? Like if we have an incident, are we required to notify partners, suppliers, or does that only happen if it's a, a more material incident? You'll notice I'm avoiding a certain word here, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly if you have a security incident, that does not escalate to the point that you have to inform everybody. There are variables that that come into play that will define it in such a way where you have to. And I would certainly at that point recall it a breach. Anytime you have to notify customers, that to me is a breach. If, if, if it isn't a breach in data, it's a, it's a breach in trust. So you, you should, you should, you should want to get in front of that in terms of communication, not be behind the ball on terms of communication. Fair enough. It's and what in, about our it, suppliers? What about like if, if a supplier that we use, cause we're a SaaS company and we use other people's SaaS stuff. Um, if they have an incident or if they have a breach and they're also fed ramp, they're required to tell us, right? hundred percent. And that you define the boundary right there. If, if it's a vendor that we use within our authorized boundary, mm -hmm. then we can have a comfort level that we've either extended controls to them directly and we are responsible for it, mm -hmm. or that they are FedRAMP certified. And in the case where they're FedRAMP certified, they will send us, or FedRAMP ATO, I should say, they will send us, um, they have the same regulatory re responsibility that we would have in that instance, and they would have to send us uh, notification. Okay. All right. So, uh, and, and just in terms of uh, the level of other documentation, anything else? Cause I know that like the, of course we've talked about a policy, we've talked about a plan. I imagine there's an, uh, a variety of uh, procedural documents that'll also get inspected as part of FedRAMP. Yeah. Yeah, there are. So these things are going to be highly customized to the company, the platform in how they go about doing incident response. But certainly in our case, we have specific policy procedure that talks about how you go and inspect a certain application stack or how you review um, a certain log event, how you escalate logging in the event that you need to, you know, so there's a bunch of pieces that fall underneath this procedurally. And we try to, where possible, roll these things up into a single procedure. In this case, I think we're at three. Um, but the more you can aggregate that, the better it is in terms of, of document hunting you'll have to do in the, in the time of incident response. That, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yep. And then, you know, that brings up another really good point. You, we talked about dissemination of an incident response plan. Uh -huh. It's really important to consider how you disseminate a plan like this, because the platform that you would normally go and find documentation might be underneath the scope of the incident and you may not be able to trust that platform or the documentation on it. So having multiple uh, dissemination points for the team that is responsible for responding to incidents makes a lot of sense in, in this, uh, in this scenario. So, yeah, this is one where I agree with you, but you need, like I, I even recommended paper copies because odds are now admittedly they have to be controlled documents. Um, so you have to know who has a copy of it and they have to receive updated copies. But I have seen incidents where the uh, environment where the documentation has effectively gone away 
for any variety of reasons, and that's problematic if you don't have a copy that you can find quickly from home. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am not to the point where I want to have a bunch of paper copies floating around because I don't know if that's any more useful. I've seen how other people manage paper in their environments. <laughs> But what I do want is I want multiple unconnected platforms that they can go and get that documentation on. So that's a religious debate. It it doesn't matter as long as it's thought out and you have multiple sources in my mind. And with that, let's go to our final religious debate or our final fiery debate of the day, which is uh, what this beer tastes like as we, we do actually review these. Um, I have, I've, I've noticed I apparently give a lot of twos. Um, going to have to eventually figure out what is not a two. This tastes like sour coffee, though. But it's not as bad as the sour beer, which was worse. Ooh, okay. This is still a two, I think. This is you're, you're gonna still, give it a nothing, two? Has got, nothing has gone up above a two. Some things I think I might have to revise, but this is still a two. This is not something I'd want to have again. But it's not so bad that I spit it out. Well, I, uh, I've already poured the remainder into my glass, so I've been drinking it steadily. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm pretty much. There. I've, There's still some I've left enjoyed here. it uh, tremendously. I again, this isn't. Um, hey, we're gonna sit down and have three beers, right? This is a, a single drinker in my mind. It's pretty. It's pretty heavy. Um, I like it. I don't like it as much as the porter, which I think I gave the porter a seven. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back a little. I'm gonna give this a six, but I am gonna say that uh, it's it's absolutely worth trying if you're a fan of this kind of beer. And it has some unique characteristics in my mind for a nut brown ale. It's it's a little thicker and it certainly has a little more bite to it than I'm used to seeing in a beer like this. So I go try it. I you about on the bite. Yep. All cool. right. Well, I, think, I think that's that, it for... I think that's it for drafting compliance today. So uh, please do like and subscribe so you get notifications when we have new episodes come out every two weeks. With that, Tom, it's been fun and I'll see you next time. We'll see you all next time. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,